What is up, everybody? We are back for another edition of Vendetta Sports Media's T20 World Cup coverage. I'm Jerry Walker, and with me always, the man down under, Jared Prosser. And Jared, first of all, how are you doing this morning? Yeah, yeah, it's quarter past 12 in the morning here. I'm, um, yes, yeah, Saturday morning. I've been out coaching most of Friday night. Um, very tired, to be frank with you, Jerry, but got my trusty Tasmanian cider. I'll get through this pretty well. We've had some good cricket to watch, too. Yes, we have, and only three matches have happened over the last two days, so some exciting stuff. We know a lot more about what's going to be happening in the semifinal and who's going to be making it and who needs what to happen. But we'll get into the matches first and foremost, starting off with Pakistan and South Africa and another game affected by the rain. Pakistan ultimately won by 33 runs, but they need the Duckworth Lewis method to get it done. 185 for nine, where South Africa needed 142 was their set target in their 14 overs, and they reached 108 for nine. So any initial thoughts just on this? Um, yeah, look, it's Duckworth Lewis always seems to favor the team batting first. I again it's it's a it's a system that's been around for, for decades now, like probably 40 years. And it's been tweaked here and there, but ultimately it always seems to favor in limited overs matches the team that that bats first. And I don't know why that is. I'm not clever enough to figure that out. Um, but on the actual match itself, um, geez, Pakistan, like they batted first and I have no idea how they managed to make 185. They looked in all sorts of trouble early. Rizwan went, Baba Azam went, um, Muhammad Harris, who the was he 21? He's just been drafted into the team. Um, there's an injury replacement. He was magnificent. 28 off 11 balls. Like it's a, a genuine cameo, but it's his first innings batting at first drop, the most important position in a batting lineup. And Wow, he, he was electric. <laughs> I, I haven't seen this kid before, Jerry, and, and he was he was fantastic. I'm looking forward to seeing more of him. Yeah, he really was. Uh, I mean, after him, it was kind of that big jump by Ifkanda Ahmed and Shabad Khan, who they took Pakistan from 95 for five to 177 for six and really exploded. Ahmed went 51 from 35 with three boundaries and two sixes. And Shabad Khan went 52 for 22, three boundaries, four sixes. So those two really ended up just carrying Pakistan later in that inning and really made it a match and something that we didn't think could have happened after, like you mentioned, that really slow start for Pakistan. Yeah, Khan, Khan was, Shabad Khan was just, man, he, he, was, he was off the planet tonight. Like 52 from 22, three fours, four sixes, but... He like this wasn't all this wasn't like he was just you know playing cricket shots. This is one of these things where he just went, screw it, I'm gonna hit the ball hard, I'm gonna swing hard. If I hit it, it's going to the rope. If I don't, I might be out, but bugger it. Yeah, this is this was almost a back to the walls thing. Pakistan needed to win this to keep their hopes alive. Their top order was just decimated. And it was almost like you thought, well, screw it. If I'm going out, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. And he damn well did, 52 of 22 for the veteran. Yeah, it was really yeah. And I mean, as far as the – we'll talk a bit on him later, but his bowling was outstanding as well. But yeah. as far as the South African bowling went, Arnich Nori got a second four for, I think, in this World Cup, finishing mm. four for 41. And – he really kind of was the one star of the South African bowling attack this match. He's very, very impressive. I thought Parnell bowled well at the top of the order. Um, didn't get perhaps the the figures he would have liked, but I thought he bowled well. But uh, Nortia was, um, yeah, look, he was a little bit expensive. He, he was one who suffered a little bit from that lower middle order of Ahmed. Mohamed Nawaz, who we didn't mention, 28 of 22, and uh, Shadab, who just, as we mentioned, blitzed everything. So his figures were, his, his runs conceded was blown out a little bit by those three, but ultimately he was very dangerous. Four wickets and four overs. You can't argue against that. No, not at all. I mean, he got two early wickets. He got a wicket in the fifth over, getting out Muhammad Harris, and then a wicket in the seventh mm -hmm. over, where at that point, you know, Pakistan was 43 for four, and he was on a tear just mowing down batters in that order. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, you, you look at 
what South Africa did in response. And again, you know, we mentioned before Quentin de Kock and Riley Rousseau, they really are the key batsmen for this side. De Kock, you know, a duck off five balls, Rousseau seven or six. But it was nice to see the skipper, Temba Bavuma, break out of his slump. And he, he really hadn't batted well this entire tournament. But 36 off 19, it's not a huge score, but the the ease with which he was hitting the boundary, the ease with which he was able to get the ball away was really encouraging. And hopefully for South Africa, who, as we'll mention later, are you know, just about a lock to make it. Um, you know, hopefully... You know, South Africa to win this tournament need a, a, need Temba Bavuma in form at the top of the order, and he's been terrible so far. So hopefully this is a really good sign for the for the box. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, they, they get a bit later, but if they do play, end up making the semifinal, I'm sure we'll see Quinton Dinock and Riley Rousseau get back to the form we've seen them in this entire World Cup. Just mark it off to another bad a one bad day at the office, but. What stood out to you about the Pakistani bowling? I mean, should, we'll mention it, Shadab Khan, two wickets, 16 runs allowed, missed two overs. He was all around superb in this match. But Yeah, he bowled well. I mean, two wickets and two overs, yes, he conceded 16 runs, but, you know, so what? The, the ball he got Aiden Markham with was a gem of a leg spinner. Just completely beat him in, like, beat him on length, but he beat him on length because that ball dipped in a hurry. Uh, just a perfect leg spinning delivery. Uh, well, I, actually, I'll backtrack on that. The perfect leg spinning delivery fades into the right hander and spins away. This was one where it didn't spin all that much, but the fact that it, like the, the top spin on it, it just dropped so quickly on him and just completely threw Markham for length. Um, yeah, I, and I was really, really impressed with uh, Shaheen Afridi. He's he's a sort of bowler who is a bit trick or treat, but he was very much on today. Three for, th sorry, I was going to say three for three, three for 14 from three overs, 11 dot balls in the 18 that he bowled. Just a, a, a brilliant, brilliant performance. Picked up wickets all through the innings as well. Yeah, and I mean, he was the guy that got out Quinn de Kock and Riley Rousseau early. So he was kind of setting the tone for his whole inning. And like you mentioned it, it was just, it was really those two guys kind of holding down the fort for Pakistan. I mean, Nasim Shah, one wicket, 19 runs in his three. And then Mohammad Wasim, one wicket for 13 runs in his two overs. But, I mean, up after that, it was kind of not too much to mention on the Pakistani bowling side. Yeah, there, there was some, like, the, the middle order for, for South Africa looks like they were going to, to pull something out. Markham had 20 before Khan cleaned him up. Uh, Tristan Saab, Stubbs, sorry, Heinrich Klaassen, they were looking good before Klaassen got taken out by mm. Afridi. But this was one of those ones where, you know, rain interrupted this game at the end of the ninth over with, with South Africa batting. They were on four for 69 at the time. So what really hurts in the Duckworth-Lewis uh, method in that system is not so much the 69 runs that they'd scored, but the fact that they'd lost four wickets. So when they resumed, they needed 73 to win off five overs, 30 deliveries, which is a just a monstrous, monstrous ask. You're looking at about 14 and over. But Klaassen and Stubbs, um, they added 25 in two overs. They were really looking good. And then it was when Afridi dismissed Klaassen that the, you know, the, the Pakistan, the, uh, sorry, the South African resistance kind of fell away from there. So not only did he take out their two big guns, Afridi, but... He also put an end to that late little run that, that South Africa was threatening to, to make. Yeah, completely. <laughs> Up next for both teams, it's as we'll get to a little bit more detail, but Pakistan plays Bangladesh. Both those teams still have a hope to get in by cool, but South Africa plays Netherlands, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But up next was Ireland and New Zealand, and New Zealand was the first team to clinch a spot in the semi-final by beating the Irish by 35 runs, 185 for six to 150 for nine. And it was, to me, it was a good start for New Zealand. They lost their first wicket at 52 runs. Ben Allen and Devin Conway each respectively went 32 from 18 and 28 from 33. So Conway was a little bit more expensive, but still a solid start by the Kiwis. Yeah, this this was a, a really good performance by that top five. 
Um, Allen got a start. Conway got a start. Phillips, who's been in electric form, was uh, looking like he could take the game away. He had 17 off just nine. And Daryl Mitchell, who he's almost... Every time Mitchell's come in, it's almost been too late for him to really build anything. And he had a, a, a nice 31, not out of 21. But the big story from the New Zealand batting innings is that Kane Williamson started to look like Kane Williamson again. The, the skipper had 61 off 35, three sixes, five boundaries. He, he looked in really, really good nick. And he's probably been the one missing link from this New Zealand side so far. Their bowlers are generally bowling really well. The openers are, bowl, are batting well. Phillips has had some huge innings, but Williamson has been scratchy. So him coming in, um, coming into form, really does help this side. We would be remiss, though, talking about the New Zealand innings without mentioning the Irish left arm quick, Josh Little. Um, I've mentioned before, look, he's young. Little's 23. That's really young in cricketing terms, especially fast bowling. But, you know, I, I haven't been all that impressed with his first trip to Australia but he's really stepped it up the last few games and in this one became the second Irishman to ever have a hat-trick in a T20 international. Yeah absolutely it's extremely impressive to see him get a hat-trick and he retired Williamson to get him out and then as well as Nishim mm. and Santer which it ultimately was a little too too little too late for Ireland to kind of slow down the New Zealand attack the damage had already been done but with those three wickets, he finished three for 22 in his four overs of work. It was just an outstanding performance from him. Anytime someone gets a hat trick, which for those who don't know, you get three wickets on three consecutive balls is an amazing feat to see. And he, um, like, you know, I mentioned that he was a, a fairly poor through the preliminary stages, but He's picked up 11 wickets in this tournament now. It's an impressive individual display. And, you know, three for 22 against the Kiwis meant that against the big guns in this group, New Zealand, England and Australia, he's got seven for 59 from 11 overs. So whilst he struggled against the teams that are similar to Ireland's level, he stepped it up when the big boys played. And that's a really, really positive sign for him individually, but also for Irish cricket, just to have that, that one guy who can, you know, I mentioned it at the, you know, in one of our first podcasts that it's the batsmen in T20 cricket who get all the highlights, but it's the bowlers who win the matches. Um, and um, having a guy like this, a, a quick, a left arm quick, who are often harder to get away, um, who, can, who can step it up against the big teams, that's a really encouraging sign for Irish cricket. Yeah, it was. And I mean, yeah. it's still a relatively young guy, as you mentioned, that... Mm -hmm. This could be a, one of the bowlers of the future for this Irish team if they ever try and want to make a run further in any Cricket World Cup. But as far as the Irish bowling goes, the other guy I kind of want to mention is Gareth Delaney. Got two wickets, gave up 30, but he had a decent performance as well. Yeah, good supporting role from Delaney. He's a good bowler. He, yeah. I'm, I've been impressed with Delaney both with bat and ball this tournament. He's, he's been pretty good. Um, there were a few that got carded, though. I mean... Barry McCarthy went for 11 and over. Hand went for 11 and over. Um, you know, Adair and Dockrell went for nine and over. You know, it was really outside of Little and I guess Delaney, there wasn't a lot to talk about from the Irish bowling, unfortunately. But we're saying that, that you know, in light of them coming up against a very, very, very good top five for the Kiwis. Absolutely. I mean, looking at the Irish inning, as good as the opening was for New Zealand, Ireland kind of won up to them a bit. The first wicket fell at 68 runs. Paul Sterling and Andy Valberni combined with or Sterling went 37 from 27, three boundaries, one six. And Valberni, 30 from 25 with three sixes. That was just a solid start. But after that, there wasn't too much support from the rest of the Irish lineup. Yeah, the, the veteran openers did well for the Irish, but um, Lorcan Tucker, who's rounded into form, he struggled 13 or 14. Tector only two, Delaney 10. Dockrell batted pretty well for for his 23, but the tail fell away really, really badly. Um, we've mentioned this New Zealand bowling lineup before. They run with the same five every match, no matter what. They very, very rarely pull out a, a sixth bowler, but... Frankly, with the five they've got, they don't necessarily need to. Mitch Santner and Ish Sodi, the two spinners, really reined this back in. 
Lockie Ferguson will take the, the bouquets here, three for 22. But I think it was the spinners who got the job done. Um, they bowled tightly. They reined in the, the run rate when those two openers, Balbani and Sterling, who both fell to the spinners, incidentally, um, were looking to you know, almost steal one for Ireland here. Um, Ferguson came in and just pretty much destroyed the middle order. And Southie cleaned up the tail. Trent Bolt, who is generally the strike bowler for New Zealand, did struggle in this one. Four overs, none for 38. But, you know, if you've got one bowler struggling and the other four are taking multiple wickets, you're probably going to do okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned Lockie yeah, Ferguson. Absolutely. He had his three wickets, but two of them came in that 18th over and really was somewhat the nail in the coffin for the Irish batting attack. They would have needed something like 40 or 50 runs to get out of that and match. But Yeah, you know, once once he got Dockrell out, once uh, Dockrell clipped one to Kane Williamson, um, once he got Dockrell out, you could see that the the air went out of the out of the, the sails. The wind went out of the sails, that's the right phrase, uh, for the Irish. And it was a shame because it was a really entertaining run chase. They always felt like they were just outside of, of having the match in control. And that, that added to the spectacle that the Irish were, you know, New Zealand always felt like they had it, had the Irish at arm's length, but just couldn't put them away. And when Ferguson got Dockle, you could just feel the game sort of settled into a pattern a bit. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, up next for the two, Ireland's packed their bags, heading back home on that long flight, I would think. But they're probably still happy. They beat England, successful-ish World Cup for them. And New Zealand will be in the semifinal. And as of now, and I don't see it changing, they'll win this group one and play the runner-up of group two, which could be, as of now, likely is going to be South Africa, but anything can change in that last day. Yeah. But now to the yeah, last... I got to admit, I, like, I wasn't all that sold on the Irish. I thought their bats were a bit too old. I wasn't really sold on the bowling lineup. But um, the Irish have had a, a pretty decent tournament. You know, they've they haven't finished bottom of their group. They've finished ahead of of Afghanistan, and we're going to get to their last game in a moment. But you know, Afghanistan are a legitimate Test cricket playing nation. The Irish are very much not. So for them to finish anywhere other than bottom of a very, very tough group. That's a successful tournament for the Irish. And, you know, applaud it to them. They've played, they've worked their way into the tournament well. It's almost like if they had another two or three matches up their sleeve, you could almost see them getting another win. They've gotten better as the tournament went on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, it was, and another thing to mention is they were one of the qualifier teams in that first few rounds, in that first yes. round that had to get out. And getting ahead of a team like Afghanistan that was automatically put into the Super 12 was a huge feat for them. But we'll move on. Yeah, that's it. They, they weren't expected to get out of, out of the uh, preliminary rounds. They, you know, the West Indies, we've almost forgotten about them, but, you know, they came out of a group that had the West Indies in there. So to do that and then to be higher on the table than Afghanistan, yeah, I, I think the Irish should be very, very proud of their tournament. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. they should be. But now moving on to Afghanistan's last match with Australia. And as far as it, your face cover says it all, as far yeah. as Australia is concerned, they needed to win this one heavily just in case England wins to fix that net run rate. And that didn't happen. Australia did it no. winning, but it was 168 for eight to 164 for seven. The net run rate still sits at minus 0.173, but... What is what are your reactions to that one? That kind of oh, look, a few we, hours ago. Australia's standing skipper with Aaron Finch out, Matthew Wade, the the keeper, he's taken up the captaincy and he nailed it after this match. And he, he just said, and I can't remember the exact quote, but I'll I'll paraphrase it. He said, We just haven't been very good. <laughs> it's 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 quite a simple statement, but it's absolutely true. Um there were some good moments for the Australians batting. I mean, Glenn Maxwell had one of those innings, 54 off, I think it was 32 balls. Yep. Um, and it was full of typical Glenn Maxwell shots where he's just making it up as he goes along. Um, Mitch Marsh, you know, finally, he's, he's looked good this tournament, but he's he always seems to just hit the ball to a fielder. Um, but he finally got off the chain with 45. Stoinis had a decent 25, Warner 25, but... There just wasn't a lot of support. Outside of those four, no Australian hit 
double figures. And they weren't even close. Wade had six. He was the fifth highest scorer. Um, so it was just a, it was a, look, they were lucky that they had a few good innings in there, the Aussies, because this could have been a much lower total mm. on another day. Mm. And if that had happened, Australia would have lost. Yeah, I think yeah. absolutely it would have been rough. But I mean, I, this is the kind of match we talked about in the last episode, Aaron Finch getting hurt. And Steve Smith came in to replace him. And he just – he looked like he hadn't played cricket in a little bit. Four runs from four balls. Look, Steve Smith, Jerry, he – in test cricket, he's so creative. He's so unusual because he's, he's always walking across his crease. He's full of all these weird little idiosyncrasies. Um, but he's not necessarily a huge hitter of the ball. He's someone who builds into his innings a little bit and then destroys teams. T20 cricket is just not the format for him. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling mm-hmm. Australia would bring him in, but, yeah, he is, it's, it's just not his format. He, he's fine in 50-over cricket even, where he can build into an innings, but when you've got to come in from ball one and just make stuff happen, that's not Steve Smith. He needs 15, 20 balls at a minimum to get his eye in. And once he does, he's unbelievable. He's an amazing batter. But yeah, T20 is just not designed for a guy like him. And the fact that Australia, and I hate to say it because he's he's so good, but the fact that Australia keeps selecting him says that we as a nation, as 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 a selectors, that we haven't quite figured out the right way to approach this format yet, that it is so different to test cricket and even 50 over cricket. Yeah, really yeah. A different game, a much more hard swinging, heavy swinging mm. attack. And I want to give some credit to the Afghanistani bowling appearance mm. with Fazakal Faralki. He got two wickets from 29 for 29 runs. Uh, Naveem Ulhaq, who got three wickets for 21 runs. But they also, as a team, they got three wickets from Australia in the power play, including two in that sixth over, both from Ulhaq, I believe. Yeah, Naveen Ulhaq Murid, he was excellent in this game. Um, just very difficult to get away, as you can as you can tell with the figures of uh, three for twenty one in four overs. It's it's you know, not just attacking bowling. That's 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 really difficult to get away. That's good defensive bowling as well. So now he was excellent. Australia um, weathered Rashid Khan pretty well. He's always the danger man when the Afghanis are bowling. Um, they didn't get him away too well, 29 runs, but he only picked up the one wicket. And Rashid Khan is the type of bowler who can tear through a middle order. Uh, Muhammad Nabi was castled in his one over for 14. But, you know, ultimately when the big guns didn't fire, it, was, it, it wasn't too much of an issue because Marid was, was fantastic. Yeah, and I mean, as far as the Afghanistani batting side of things went, solid start from Rahamula Gurbaz. Who went, Kibaz, yeah. Kibaz, 30 for 17, two boundaries, two sixes. But then after that, it was, I mean, not necessarily right away, but Idrahan Zerdan and Golabal Nabi both combined for, what, 26 for 33 and 39 for 23 was and a pretty reasonable inning. Yeah, it was. Like the, you could see the wind go out of Australia's sails when they realised that they weren't going to win this by 80 or 90 runs, which would at least give them a chance of catching on that run rate. Mm. Um, yeah, Gravales was really good. He was attacking. It was good to see Kane Richardson, who came into the side, and I've been you know, sort of angling for him to get in for a little while. Um, it was good to see him get a wicket. I don't think he bowled particularly well, quite frankly. He went for 48 runs and just seemed to bowl a lot of four balls. Um, the, the match, like, to be honest, Jerry, the Afghanis looked like they were going to chase this down, which would have put Australia out of the tournament before tomorrow night's Sri Lanka-England match. And that would have clearly been a disaster. The match kind of turned, though, when Naib got run out by Glenn Maxwell. Just a brilliant throw from the outfield. Really good uh, footwork to collect and throw quickly and hit the stumps directly. It didn't need to go to the keeper first. Matt Wade just stood out the way, put his hands up and thought, that's a good throw. Sure enough, hit the stumps, got him out, and there was a bit of a collapse from there. Mohamed Nabi, very dangerous player, went out quickly. Um, Zampa got Zadram, uh, the older, I think he's the older one, Najib Zadram. Um, they got him out quickly. Uh, Rasuli and Rashid Khan, though, they threatened to take this one back. 
Khan especially, he didn't really have an effect with the ball, and that's where he usually wins matches for teams. But 48 not out of 23, four sixes, three fours, it was kind of, um, you know, raging against the dying of the light because the target, the, the, well, the required run rate was quite big for Afghanistan. But I'll tell you what, he didn't die wondering. He swung hard and, you know, he, he got this to, you know, the, the, like, the Afghanis could have given up on this and it would have been a comfortable 20-run win, win for Australia on paper, but nowhere near as comfortable when you watch it. In the end, the score actually does reflect how, how tight this game was. Yeah, it does. And, I mean, looking at just the last three overs for Afghanistan, scored 16 runs in the 18th, 11 in the 19th, and 17 runs in that final over. Were, as an Australian, were you kind of starting to worry a bit that Afghanistan would maybe pull this out? Um, not especially, um, but you do look at that worm graph and it just, it rose really sharply. I wasn't especially worried because I just looked at it and thought that target is too big. Um, having said that, Marcus Stoinis wasn't particularly great with the ball. Um, I don't think he's a, a, a death bowler. Australia hasn't had a really good death bowler for, for quite a while. AJ Ty did it for a little while, four or five years ago, going back maybe 20 years ago, Ian Harvey was brilliant at it. But in limited overs cricket, whether it's 50 or 20 overs, you need a really good bowler just to to slow that run rate down at the end. And all Stoinis did was just bowl slower ball after slower ball after slower ball. The slower ball loses its effectiveness when you know it's coming. You know, all it means is that you wait and you've got an easier ball to hit. Um, Yeah, I don't think he bowled particularly well, but Frankly, the target was just a little bit too big by then. Although there was a little bit of a heart fighter, I got to admit. I, I wasn't. I felt like Australia was safe, but they probably weren't as safe as what I actually felt in retrospect. Yeah, it's completely understandable. I mean, Afghanistan looked like they were going to make a run at it late. Ended up losing by the four runs. But I did want to. You mentioned him a little bit before, Adam Zampa. He was had a great 14th over where he was a part of three wickets. He got two wickets his own and then one runner was run out but the run out and his first wicket were on back-to-back balls and he ultimately finished the match with going two wickets for 22 runs in his four overs and it was he was better than that too yeah Zampa was the one bowler that really stood out for me oh actually I thought Cameron Green was tough to get away but like every time they did get him away it went to the boundary but yeah as it generally is for Australia um, you know, Zampa is the best bowler in, in T20 cricket for Australia. I did also want to mention, I mean, Josh Hazelwood got two for, but he, two wickets, but he gave up 33. But Pat Cummins didn't get a wicket, but only allowed 22 runs with a 5.5 run rate and his four overs. So he kind of slowed down that Afghanistan batting order. Yeah, he, um, he peppered the Afghanis and Hazelwood was a bit the same, to be honest. He peppered them with a bit of, bit of short stuff. And the Afghanis struggled to get that away with Cummins more than Hazelwood, which is a surprise because Hazelwood being so tall and the bounce so steep as a result, his short balls are often tougher to get away. Mm. But, um, yeah, they just couldn't seem to connect on Cummins. Maybe it's that extra pace he's got, but he never really looked like taking the wicket because he was bowling so short. So he didn't attack the stumps at all. It, I don't know whether that was a plan that he was going to bowl short and defensive. Um, but yeah, it almost seemed like to, to my view that he was there to slow the run rate and let the other bowlers come in and take wickets. Didn't necessarily work, although he you know, clearly did hold up his end in slowing the run rate. Yeah, I mean, now Australia has to wait and hope that the result goes their way in the match. We're about a preview. The last match of Group 1, Sri Lanka versus England. It's as straightforward as you get. England win, and they go on to the semi-final. Sri Lanka win, and Australia will be in that semi-final spot. So, what are your predictions? What do you think is going to happen in this match? I have never felt so Sri Lankan in all <laughs> my days, Jerry. Um, <laughs> Sri Lanka have gotten better as this tournament goes on. The fact that the match is in Sydney, which is traditionally a, a quite a sharp spinning wicket. And the Sri Lankans have Kasaranga, who has been magnificent the entire tournament. That does give me some hope, but it's just a smidge. I, I think England, 
you know, I mentioned it in our preview pod, you know, which feels like it was ages ago now, that um, either England or India were the two most talented sides in, in the, the tournament. Um, oh, it hurts to say, but I just cannot see England losing this one. I just think they're a much, much better side. If Sri Lanka are to win this, they're going to need like Kusal Mendes to go mental with the bat. They'll need De Silva to go crazy. They'll need someone to pop up in that middle to lower order with a quick 40 off 20. And they'll need Hasaranga to take four or five wickets. Like everything mm. needs to go right for Sri Lanka. And I just can't see it happening. Yeah, I'm kind of as much as I want England to win and advance to the semifinal. I do see a way that Sri Lanka can get the win, but I it's just a little bit in. I, I don't think it'll really happen. I think England will be able to get away, get it done. I think Joss Butler is looking much better than he did early on in the tournament, and I mean Kyle Hayes as well, or Hales. But it one thing I'm I'm interested to see, Jerry, the Sri Lankans don't don't often open up with spin bowling. They'll, they'll generally go the traditional route and let the quick bowlers take the newer ball. But I don't know, mate. I mean, if it backfires, you're probably going to give up 200 runs. But do the Sri Lankans open up with Hasaranga and try and take two or three quick wickets? Honestly, I think, that's, I think that would be a bad idea. As of now, Hasaranga has been the best bowler in the tournament. He has the most wickets, at least, with, I believe, 13. and he could cause an issue for that. He causes issues for any batting order, especially you can do it against the English. And there's nothing yeah. classic then in any World Cup, especially the football one, sometimes cricket. England have a chance to advance to the semifinal and somehow find a way to blow it. But I don't <laughs> think it'll be this way this time. No, no, neither do I. I um, yeah, I, I have had, seen it said, well, Sri Lanka's got nothing to play for. But... No, they don't have as much to play for as England, clearly, where there's a semi-final berth at, 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 you know, at risk. But if Sri Lanka win this, they do finish third in the group. They finish ahead of England. So there is still something for them there. Um, it's just not a, you know, will we play another match type of scenario. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, it's my green and gold glasses and I'm just hoping against hope. But I really want the Sri Lankans to throw caution to the wind here and, Look, if they get beaten by, you know, 80, 90, 120 runs, so be it. But I I really don't want to see them just play out the string. I want to see them go for the win. Yeah, I would. If I was in your shoes, I would go the same way. I mean, see, let's hope for Sri Lanka to swing for the fences, just run rampant. Because at the end of the day, they won't be playing another match, but they can knock England out and can make someone else's day much happier. But we'll move my, on to – yeah, My day. Exactly. <laughs> We'll move on to that group two action. Each team has one match left to play. And I have a feeling we know the two teams who will be going to the semifinal, but we'll just get into them. Netherlands versus South Africa. If South Africa wins, they're into the semifinal. As happy as it was to see the Netherlands get their win against Zimbabwe, I don't see any chance that they pull off the upset against South Africa. No, no. Especially with South Africa having lost that match to Pakistan, they will be... Um, you know, they, they pretty much do need to win this. Like Pakistan and Bangladesh, who are playing each other, as we'll get to, whoever wins that match goes ahead of South Africa should South Africa lose this. Having said that, it's the Dutch. Um, they're, the for mine, the weakest side to come out of the preliminaries to make the Super 12s. And, yes, they've got their win. So I, f I feel like the Dutch are going to go home and you know, at the end of this tournament say, we don't care, we've got to win, we're happy. Um, and look, there is a little bit of colonial rivalry here that the, the Boers of South Africa against the Dutch, the homeland. But um, yeah, I mean, the talent disparity is just monstrous here. So I see South Africa with something to play for, winning this one and winning it very, very comfortably. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I don't really see the Netherlands putting up much of a fight. For the next match that's happening, I believe it'll be what Sun South. It's Pakistan. Yeah, yeah Pakistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Is that Monday yeah. night your time? I believe. Uh, no, yeah. Sunday. Sunday. Sunday afternoon. afternoon. But all these, yeah, both of these games are in Adelaide. But oh, yeah. you know what? I really wish the ICC would just switch the order of these matches. Uh, South Africa beat the Netherlands. Then Pakistan and Bangladesh have nothing to play for. Neither of them can overtake 
the, the South Africans. So I would say let those two play first and whoever wins goes ahead of South Africa. That means the Proteas have all sorts of jeopardy on the match. You know, like, I, I, I just think because South Africa really should win against the Netherlands, I really think the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis will end up just playing out one of the more tepid games of T20 cricket that we'll ever see. I, I think it's going to be an absolute bore, that game. And I it's a shame because they're both entertaining sides. I will say that if we'll get to the last match of India and Zimbabwe in a second, but if Pakistan does beat Bangladesh, as of right now, they would jump over India based on that net run rate. So the pressure would be on the Indian side to knock off their arch nemesis. Oh, Jerry Walker, that is a superb point. That is an excellent point. I completely overlooked that. Yeah. You are dead right. So even if South Africa win, Pakistan, at the very least, still have something to play for. Which, given as Pakistan, could be bad news. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but no, you're dead right. I'd completely overlooked the net run rate here. That's a, that's a great call by you. Because yeah, as of right now, Pakistan's net run rate is 1.117, whereas India has a 0.730. So it's a significant difference in that net run rate. But it all kind of, if Pakistan does win, it'll come down to can India or will India lose to Zimbabwe? And I personally don't think that'll happen. No, no. I think it'll come down to how much India can beat Zimbabwe by. Yeah. Um, just to round off Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, yeah, look, I, I think Pakistan will get it done. They are a more talented side, not by an immense amount, but they're a more talented side than Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as much as Pakistan have a tendency to shrivel up and die when the pressure's on, um, I just... I don't know. There's just something. You know, the good players in this Pakistan side haven't fired yet, so they're due. So I'm going to call it. I'm going to say Pakistan. You know, the Babur's arms of the world will step up, and they'll get Pakistan over Bangladesh, and it will come down to that India Zimbabwe match to sort out the last semi-finalists, which is a really great tournament. If you can get to the last group match and you still don't have your semi-finalists, then you know things have been. Know, fairly even and fairly, fairly tight. Yeah, I mean, even no. one, it's going down to the last match of that group to decide the other semi-final spot. So this has really been just an outstanding and exciting T20 Cricket World Cup, in my opinion. Yeah, it's been it a blast to follow and watch along with. But I, India, Zimbabwe, we kind of touched on it. I'd say, at least I think India will win. I assume you think the same in terms of this. Yeah, it, it, I've really enjoyed watching your Zimbabwean bowling attack. Um, yeah, they're all fairly young. They're all you know, relatively unknown, but they've been really exciting. Um, this is bad podcasting, Jerry, but I'm just checking my weather app because the India-Zimbabwe game is, is in it? Melbourne. Yes, it is. So I'm just going to have a quick look at what... Oh, okay, no. I don't think we'll be affected by rain on Sunday. Oh, 20 yeah. degrees, um, Max, and it's not 20 degrees Fahrenheit for all the Americans watching. Um, so 20 degrees, you know, slightly overcast. We're, we're going to get 40 overs of cricket in that one. And if that's the case, I honestly think India will win it. And it's a shame because Zimbabwe have been really entertaining, but I think India will win it pretty comfortably. Yeah, I agree. And for those who don't know the difference between so, the translation from centigrade or Celsius to Fahrenheit, it's roughly going to be 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny in Melbourne. But that's kind of... I'll take your word. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just used my weather app to check the conversion time or difference. But that's kind of all from us. The next time you see us, we'll be talking about the semifinals. We'll know who's in, who's out. But thank you guys for watching this so far. It's been a blast for us. You can reach out to Jared on Twitter at hey underscore hey underscore it's underscore JP. Reach out to me at Jerry F007 and check out all of our other stuff. Jared's been doing a great job as always covering the NBA, especially the recent issues with the LA Lakers and the Brooklyn Nets as well, and everything that's going on with Kyrie Irving. Ooh. And uh, check out Jerry's World Cup previews as well while we're at it. He's covering all of the teams, previewing them all. We're going to do a, a round table before long, so keep an eye on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We got a lot of good stuff coming your way from Vendetta Sports Media. Check, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitter. Check out our website. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time.